At any given time, you, you can see mom and pop working in the business with our dog and our kids and all of our family called employees. They're just part of us. And so Ella, Amos is one of the longest running employees we have. You, I think you are the, she has done every position you can think of from, um, Ella's worked in every position, including plant foreman, department heads, she knows plants. She, she knows more about plants than I do sometimes. I'm going, whoa, I didn't. I learn stuff. Every time she speaks, I learn something. I thought she'd be the perfect person because she's seen so many different types of soils that she could teach you how to actually put something in the ground and have it thrive. If you take shortcuts in our soil, you will fail. Or it'll sit there and look at you. It won't grow. It's been in the ground three years. It's still the same size you put in the ground. It hasn't grown, but it hasn't died. It's just not doing anything. That's like the ultimate insult. If you're, if you're gonna die, at least die right away. Don't sit there and struggle or grow, decide. And so uh, she'll, she'll show you what we've learned over the decades, what really seems to work in our area. I can tell you the new properties are some of the worst we've ever seen. In fact, we have to up, we have a planting service. We have two planting trucks that just roam around the countryside installing trees and shrubs. We had to buy a 70 pound jackhammer. We've always been able to get by with 35 pound jackhammers, the smaller one, easy to work with less hardware. The guys were asking for, boss, we need the big one. Electric one. Go get your electrics, go get them, go, go. And so, because the rock, those new uh, Prescott Lakes, the ridge lines, uh, but the properties are just impossible. Dewey, all the way out to, to, to Dewey, Mayor, that soil is terrible, it's ridiculous. I don't know how anything grows, but we can show you. So if you take these, these tips and work with them, whether it's a tree, a shrub, a vine, it's going to make a difference. Okay. So with that, Ella Amos is going to actually go over and, and go over uh, uh, how to plant stuff. So I'm here. Like you said, it, it really all begins with the planting. I mean, no matter what you do, how well you maintain your landscape, if you don't plant it right the first time, the whole thing's ruined. I could. Uh, I can tell you stories about the trees I've looked at. People call me out to their, their properties and say, what is going on with this tree? It hasn't grown a single inch in the 10 years that I've had it. This actually does happen, and it comes down to the planting. It wasn't planted correctly, and once it gets to that point, there's nothing you can really do about it except toss the tree, actually dig it up, toss it, get a new one, it, start from scratch. You'll sometimes see something kind of similar happen out in uh, nature. Some of you have boulders in your yard. Look around at uh, the, the trees growing wild in your area. Usually there's a little bit of wild land still around uh, our properties. It's a nice thing about living in Prescott. We have a lot of natural area. Uh, if you're noticing that the trees are have a, a real thick trunk but aren't very tall, it's a sign of being root bound. Uh, in their case, it's happening because they're trying to grow a rock. There's just nowhere for the roots to go. But the same exact thing will actually happen if you don't plant correctly. So I've seen this happen uh, it just, just a couple weeks ago. I was at someone's house taking a look at her tree and same thing. They've been in there, in, in this case it was five, six years. That still looked, didn't look very different from the day they were planted. Uh, also a lot of other problems can happen. If they don't root out properly, they're more likely to blow over in the wind because they've never actually rooted. Uh, they'll, they'll have uh, issues with taking up water and soil. You'll see a lot of stress, especially during hot periods, because they're not properly rooted. You've got to have a good, well-anchored tree, plant, vegetable, whatever it is. The planting, uh, the way you plant is the same for all of them. Even if it's something really small, it's going to stress out and it's not going to produce a lot of flowers or healthy looking leaves or fruit or vegetables, whatever it is you're, you're planting, you need it to be in peak condition and it's all going to begin with the planting. So what I like to do, I've actually taken a, a tub here and filled it with dirt so I can plant right in front of you. That helps me uh, remember all the, the tips and tricks that I've learned over the years as I'm doing it. I've actually put uh, some cloth over the, uh, the dirt and put some gravel on top of it. That's what most of us have these days it's going to be weed cloth and gravel over the dirt. So the first thing we want to do 
and start clearing this, and you're going to kind of pay attention to your area as well. Uh, always kind of be looking out. I'm going to be able to put some of this in. You want to kind of clear right back that gravel. All right. I did a good job of making it realistic. So that's what you, uh, you're going to do. You're going to find that the thick, chunky gravel is going to be the hardest to work with. Sometimes that's the worst part of the yard before deal. Again, kind of take note of what kind of area you're in. Let's say, for example, you've got a lot of granite boulders in your yard. You hear me okay over the noise? Okay, good. Uh, if you've got a lot of granite boulders in your yard, be aware those are not just rocks sitting in the yard. What you're actually seeing are the tips of the icebergs. You're standing on the rock. It's just one giant boulder that you are standing on, and you're seeing the tips peeking out of the soil. So you need to take a note, if you're in an area like that, where is the, the soil deepest, and where is it going to drain? Because quite often that soil is only a few inches, maybe a foot down. Maybe it goes a couple feet and you can get the roof all in all the way, but maybe it doesn't drain. Uh, in the case of, if you don't have the granite, you generally have a very, very dense clay, which again can sometimes have drainage issues. So in both cases, I do recommend that you do a kind of perk test, which means you're going to dig your hole. This uh, kind of helps to plan ahead. Dig your hole, fill it with water, and see if it drains because we do see a lot of areas where it just doesn't drain. So after you move that gravel out of your way, I'm going to get in there. Now I've seen, I've seen uh, times where someone just kind of cut out this huge hole uh, in their weed cloth and just cut it out and threw it away. Well, I figured a weed cloth is there for a reason. Why waste it? So I like to put it back at least part of the way when I'm done. So I, I cut a kind of star pattern, usually uh, into four or five triangles and just pulled it back with the gravel. You'll notice that I kind of have this uh, at an angle. Part of that is so that you can see it better. Part of it is also because we live in the mountains and quite often our properties are sloped. And so you will be dealing with a uh, a lot of these sloped areas up there. So because of that, oh, I, I'm gonna have to steal something. I'm short one bucket. There we go. So you're gonna take your wheelbarrow and you're gonna start digging. Now if you're dealing with, uh, like I said, most of us have a, a thick, hard clay. It is hard as rock, especially when dry. You'll find that uh, our planting crew actually carries jackhammers, like Ken was saying, and we use them at almost every job. A few of you, especially those of you who have boulders, actually have uh, disintegrated granite, so it's more sandy. Don't let that fool you. In most cases, it's still hard as rock. That disintegrated granite has the ability to compact like nothing else. So it's still very hard. So when you're going to uh, get out there and start digging, you'll actually want to start, uh, make sure you have the right tools. I would recommend you get something powered if it's something you have the ability to do. Uh, those jackhammers can be a little on the heavy side, but sometimes they're worth it, especially if you're doing big trees. At the very least, have a, a pickaxe, digging bar, don't think you're going to go at this with a shovel alone, please don't even try. Have something on hand, you're going to be needing it. So get, get your pickaxe, your digging bar, whatever it is that you feel more comfortable using, and go at it with that. So you basically will start by hacking at it with the pickaxe or the jackhammer or whatever, and then you'll take your shovel and, and scoop it out. And that goes, like I said, for both the clay and for the disintegrated granite. In both cases, in both cases, you will find that uh, there's a lot of rock, especially with the clay and especially with the newer homes. So basically what happens is uh, they go into these new homes 
and they clear out all the natural stuff, the topsoil, the softer, more nutritious stuff. They clear that out. They just scrape it away, it's gone, you'll never see it again, and uh, you're down to this rocky, hard stuff that there's nothing good in it, nothing. And so that's why it's so important that you actually uh, plant and amend your soil. Sometimes they'll level out the yard. Again, we're in the mountains, lots of slopes. So they'll actually level out the, the, the yard by bringing a fill dirt, uh, scraping things around, trying to bring the hill down in the valley kind of idea. Uh, again, it's terribly rocky lately. Uh, the, the houses they've been building have been getting the cheapest, most worthless, rockiest soil possible. And then they pack it down real hard. So we're talking a lot of rock. A lot of times you'll decide you want to pay someone to do this. Even so, I think it's a good idea to learn what, what it is you actually need to do so that you can make sure that the guy you hired is actually doing it right. Some of them will cut corners. I've seen this many times. They'll come in with, say, a post hole digger, and they'll, they'll take out a hole barely, uh, barely big enough to get the root ball into, and then they'll just kind of shove it in there. And what will end up happening when you do that is the roots never actually root out. They just keep spiraling around in the hole as if they're still in a container. And that will cause that, that stunted growth uh, that we often see. So dig your hole two to three times as wide as the root ball that you're going to be digging. So you see here, I'm digging a hole in here. Okay, how big is this? Let's take a look at our tree and see how big it really is. And again, this goes for any size plant. So I want to make the hole two to three times bigger. This is going to create a transition, so, transition zone for the roots to, to make it out into the natural or outer soil. I almost don't even want to call it natural. But sooner or later, they've got to root into that hard, compacted, rocky, awful dirt. They've got to learn how to live in it. So you don't want to take that dirt out and replace it. I've, I've had many come in from other states and ask, can I, can I just, it's, it's such awful so soil, can I please just replace it with something else? And the answer is no. Otherwise, it'll never actually learn how to live in that. It'll never root out far enough. The roots of a tree are about as uh, long, a little bit longer than the branches. So if that's got a 20-foot spread, it means the roots need to go that far. So don't go thinking that you can just have it spiraling around inside this, this, this hole because they do have trouble transitioning from one kind of dirt, one kind of soil, into something completely, totally different, especially when it's a lower grade of soil. It makes it very difficult for them to make that transition. So you want to take, uh, take that hole, make it bigger, make it wider. You want it the same depth as the root ball. So the surface of the root ball should be about the same as the surface of the ground. It's okay, actually, to make it a little higher, but don't go lower. Uh, you'll see whenever a good monsoon hits, all the trees that are planted low end up dying off. Remember 2016 when we got all that rain? We replaced so many trees that other people had planted because they had planted too low. Every tree that was planted too low died off that year. We saw a lot of it. We see it every year, but saw a lot of it that year. So you don't want to go too low. Yes, it, it basically just funnels all the water and even the soil into the hole. Eventually the soil uh, actually fills up the hole and girdles the tree if, the, if it doesn't drown first. Uh, if there's, you don't want to have any soil against the trunk. That will lop the bark off and cut off the vascular system. So, as you can see, I'm planting on a slope. Now, what I want is for the surface of this root ball to be closer to the top rather than the bottom of the hole. I'm going to fill this in a little bit, bring it up. Because, again, we don't want water yanking that soil down the slope and burying this, this tree. It can turn into a problem. So I brought that up a little bit. 
So I'm going to take this soil that we dug out, we've got it here in our wheelbarrow. All right. And in front of me, you see there's a bag of premium mulch. That is for mending tough Prescott soils. So what it is, it's compost. It's, it's um, actually wood matter that's been composted for, oh, years upon years, something like 20, 25 years. It's, it's uh, been going for a long time. Where's the source of that? It's actually an old sawmill uh, that closed down, like I said, about 25 years ago. And we were able to get that source for this. So very well composted, beautiful. You can see how black, beautiful looking that is. So when you take this and mix it in, I'm going to do about uh, two parts native dirt to uh, one part mulch. I'm going to mix that up together, and we're going to make a nice pretty mess, because that's the fun part. Any rocks that you see over the size of a golf ball, you can go ahead and take out. In this case, the soil isn't that hard to dig in because I basically just took it from that pile of AB that we had sitting in the back. But when you're doing this, you're going to find a lot of rock. You're going to find everything from the size of a golf ball to big, big rocks. Take it all out. They can't hold water. They can't hold nutrients. You can't pull out every single pebble. But if it's the size of a golf ball, then you know that's, that's a reasonable size to, to start with. So basically, this, this compost, uh, because like I said, you're not planting in the natural topsoil, you're down in something else. Fill dirt and, and bedrock and things like that that weren't really meant to be the prime soil for things to grow in. So you've amended it with the compost. And the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna break up those roots. Score it up, rough it up a bit. In the case of big trees, you may sometimes either, in my case, I know how to get the pot off, but trees can be kind of heavy. If you need to, just cut it off. I find a pair of loppers works really well for that. Or if you've got a sawzall on your hand, that'll work too. So you want to rough this up. I don't want a smooth root ball uh, going in there that just, I want the, the sides to be kind of rough so that they kind of mesh with the outer soil. I don't want a separation in there, creating air pockets, keeping the roots from transitioning. So it's going from this really nice growing medium into this really bad soil, but it's going through a mixture of the two, which will give it a good transitionary area. It'll also help attract things like uh, earthworms and microbes that are necessary for plant life. And then I'm going to go ahead Put, uh, and start filling in that, that soil. But first, there's something, a couple other things I, I want to put in here as well. So I've got my premium mulch. I also want to put in some fertilizer. Now this one right here is the water's all-purpose. Uh, you'll notice when you get close to it, it has a bit of a smell. Natural ingredients. It's actually cottonseed meal and bird guano and natural stuff, minerals that the plant is going to need to thrive iron, sulfur, things like that. It's basically a really good complete meal. We also brought back, or rather we, should, we developed, this one that just came into the store. This is a new fruit and veggie food. So this is also a, a great fertilizer to use. Very similar to the all-purpose, but with a few changes to make it perfect for anything that is uh, fruiting or flowering or for vegetables. Uh, the seven, uh, the all-purpose was 744. That's called the NPK. You look at a, a fertilizer, there's always three numbers on the front. Those are your macronutrients. Kind of like we have macronutrients that we have to make sure we have in our everyday diet. We have our protein and our carbs and our beneficial fats. Well, for them, it's nitrogen, protein, excuse me, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. So right here. Now you'll notice there's a fourth number here that isn't normally there. That fourth number that we've added, that's the calcium. A good fertilizer should always have calcium, but it's particularly important when you're growing your vegetables and fruits. 
Otherwise, you end up with blossom end rot, especially on things like tomatoes, bell peppers. You have to have that calcium. Uh, with vegetables and fruits, it's, it's a good idea to fertilize fairly frequently because they're taking up so many nutrients and growing so fast. So you really got to have a good food and keep up with a very regular routine. With the 744, we generally say for most things, for your ornamentals especially, you should go about three, every three months with, uh, with vegetables, whether it's this one or this one. We actually recommend you, you do it more like every six or eight weeks. Do it a little more often. What's the yes. NPK on the all-purpose? So on the all-purpose, the NPK was 744. Okay, same as that. And this one is actually 644. Okay. Since you're doing it a little more often, the, the nitrogen doesn't have to be quite as high, but what is especially important is that phosphorus. That middle number is what controls blooming and rooting. Without that, your tomato uh, plant will never bloom. Your zucchini plant will not bloom. And without those blooms, you'll never get fruit. It's also uh, important for roots. So for example, when you plant those turnips and those carrots and those onions, there's got to be phosphorus. Otherwise, you'll end up with all this, these green leaves on top and no root at the bottom. Have you ever noticed uh, maybe your, your first time gardening, you pulled up your carrots and they were really tiny? or the, the turnips or, or whatever it was you were growing and you wondered why it never grew a bulb. That's why you were getting the nitrogen, but you weren't getting the phosphorus. And then the potassium is also an important nutrient for oh, immunity, stronger stems, uh, and also making a, a more nutritious food for, for you to eat. So it's important to have that. And then of course, we've added extra calcium to this guy. So anything that blooms, anything that fruits, any kind of vegetable, this is excellent. So you can use either one. Is that water soluble? It's not a water soluble. Again, we're talking natural nutrients. Uh, this one is more uh, meat, bone meal, blood meal, that kind of stuff. Again, so you, once you have your plant planted, mm -hmm. you just sprinkle it around. And actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, as I'm planting, and yes, after it's planted, you'll regularly apply it by sprinkling it on the top. But as, since I'm planting, I'm actually going to add it right in, work it in there. For those of you who have those sandier soils, again, those of you that are in the granite boulders, oh my goodness, your soil does not hold water well. You'll notice that you're constantly watering. Oh, thank you. These are Aqua Boost crystals. Uh, this stuff right here, the real tiny little crystals, I know it doesn't look like much, but when these absorb water, they'll actually be about an eighth to a quarter of an inch wide. So you mix these in uh, with the soil as well, and they will help the soil to retain water twice as well as it did before. Is, you that, can, is that like a polymer? Right, but not, a, not like the kind my glasses are made of. <laughs> right, no, right. Yeah. Yes, so um, it's, a, it's a, a gel that's going to absorb water, help uh, retain, so put it in your containers. Did you notice that you were having to water those containers a lot more often this year? So those Aqua Boost crystals would have made all the difference. You would have found yourself watering about half the time. So anytime you have issues with that, definitely add those crystals. All right. So we're going to go ahead and mix, take our mix here. We've got our premium mulch, we've got our Waters plant food formulated specifically for this area, because let's face it, we don't have great dirt here. There, if you were to do a test, and it's, uh, we, we actually sell test kits and do soil tests for our customers, and you will find that there are no Many of the, most of the nutrients that your plant needs are not naturally occurring in the soil, especially when you're not planting in the natural topsoil. It's even worse. There's no nitrogen. It's a little phosphorus and, and potash sometimes, sometimes. As for the micronutrients, they're usually tied up. We have a very um, high pH, which is unusual. Most of the country is acidic or actually alkaline. 
So we have to do the exact opposite of what, what other people do. So maybe you're used to putting lime in your soil if you came from another state. We're actually gonna have you use sulfur and acidify instead. Bring that pH down, it's too high already. All right, so I'm gonna put in, put some of this in. I don't wanna press down too hard. I just wanna kind of fill it in, hold it up. And what I'm gonna do is make sure it's standing straight. On this lower side, we're going to be adding more dirt. Make sure it gets under the weed cloth, not over. I've seen people do that. All right. File it up under there. Okay. Make sure that it's standing straight. I want to kind of push it this way, and I'm going to press in the soil on that side. Kind of hold it up. So this is a living thing. That doesn't mean that uh, it's going to be perfectly straight to the micrometer. So uh, that means if it's got a little bit of a bow or a little bit of you know a curve to it, just try to make sure that the overall tree is, is straight. Uh, either the overall tree in the case of short trees or sometimes in the really tall ones, the part of the, the trunk that's going to be exposed is the most important part. And just kind of make sure that the, kind of the top kind of uh, matches with the bottom fairly well. Sometimes you just have to let your mind's eye take over and say, does that look right? All right. And then once you've got it straight, you can go ahead, fill in, and press the soil down really good. Now, normally we'd be doing this on the ground, so you're actually gonna use your feet. So you'll uh, kind of dance around the tree a little bit. Don't be afraid to add, add weight. You really want to, to press the soil in really good. Don't be afraid of overcompacting it. You can't. I don't care how big you are, you're not heavy enough to overcompact it. Move this some more. Be some soil left over. What I find is that usually the uh, the wheelbarrow is not enough if you're doing big trees. The wheelbarrow won't hold enough sir, uh, dirt. So what I do is I just take the pot that the tree came out of and put the excess dirt in there. As you're digging, keep your eyes out. I'm gonna pass something around here. Ah, oh, there it is. Hey Ken, could I have that piece of paper and bottle? Since I'm wired up to the microphone, I can't go over there. <laughs> and if you could just pass that, uh, that piece of paper around, please. All right. Then we'll get some, some dirt under that bottle. Yeah, I'll take the bottle, and if you could pass around. Pass around uh, that piece of paper. What I'm passing around is a, a picture of grubs and wireworm. Grubs are extremely common. Why don't I also interrupt yeah, for a second? Ahead. Sure, sure. We've got a planting guide. It's one sheet. Goes over pictures, exactly how much of each by size of plant. We'll send that to you digitally, PDF. So you can read it on your iPad or whatever. If you want a copy of that, put your email down here. Oh. And I'll get that out to you this afternoon. I'll just take a moment this afternoon and get it to you. So. Now, if you, if you did take quite great right notes, mm -hmm. you'll have the detail coming. So what, uh, what, again, we're passing around is the picture of the grubs. Extremely common in this area. They feed on the roots of trees and all sorts of plants. They will kill a tree, a whole tree. Doesn't matter how big it is. If the infestation is bad enough, or if they have enough time to do it, sooner or later, they'll actually kill off a whole tree. So if you see them in the soil, you need to get rid of them. Uh, kind of keep your eyes open. They come in every kind of size, from the size of my pinky nail to the size of my thumb. Some of them look like jumbo shrimp. <laughs> every size in between. So uh, they'll be white, yellow, or gray. Most of the time, especially during the warm season, they're fairly glossy. So sometimes when they're curled up real tight, it'll just look like a glossy little rock. 
a lot of people will miss them because of that. So keep your eyes open. If you see something shining in the dirt, take a closer look. If you see them, they have to die. Do not let them go. If that is the case, you can also either mix in or top it with some grub killer. Take care of that. Do what, not what, leave uh, them unharmed. What beetle lays that egg? All, uh, mini beetles. Many, many beetles will lay those eggs in the soil and then the, the grubs will travel around underneath the, yeah. the weed cloth looking for plants to kill. Yeah. And you'll see, especially if you have a bunch of shrubs or plants next to each other, you see one go, then the next, then the next. If it's a lawn, you'll see the uh, 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 spot that gets bigger and bigger and kind of spreads yeah. out like a fan or in a circle. And if you uh, dig right where the dead grass meets the live, that's where you'll find them. So now that I've got this, this soil pressed in, I'm gonna go ahead and kind of dig a, 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 a moat here. Especially on the, on the lower side, it's gonna be more like a berm. You don't, uh, again, you don't want a well. A well is permanent. You don't want to plant your, your plant low. That's a permanent thing that you can never fix again. But you can do moats. You can even do, in some cases, berms. Um, that's something you can always change or adjust as the weather changes as needed. That ensures that when we water this, it won't end up uh, it won't just run off. We don't want the water to just run off. We want it to go straight into the roots. I'm going to take my scissors and cut. To the desired size. Again, because we didn't cut it way out here. I've seen that done. We didn't need to do that. Weed cloth will help uh, keep the weeds down makes it harder for the grubs and other things to get in there because the beetles need to be able to make contact with the soil to, to uh, lay eggs. So now there's a smaller spot for her. She'll still often find her way in because she knows that the best place to, to plant her eggs is right around a plant or a tree. It gets watered regularly. They will especially come to those that uh, that are overwatered. Overwatered plants are more likely to get rubs. They love things that are watered frequently. All right. So now, put the, the gravel on. And now I'll also kind of help. If it's a steep slope, we've kind of built up a berm here. This will help to stabilize it. having the, the weed cloth and the gravel on top of it. This may not be the prettiest job I'm doing, I've ever done, but I, I don't want to have it here all night or for the next hour. This is a thick, chunky gravel, so if I wanted to even let some of it get into the, the mold, that would actually be okay. I wouldn't do it with disintegrated granite. Some of you have disintegrated granite on top of this, uh, the weed cloth. Uh, that will just fill up your mold and then water won't be able to flow through it very well. So that's a case where I wouldn't do that. All right. So depending on the circumstances, I will either bring it up to the berm, or sometimes I'll even bring it up closer. I won't have any gravel directly on the trunk. Keep it away a few inches. Again, during wet seasons, that can allow water to be held against the trunk and cause rotting. We don't want that. So once everything's pretty again, all right. Now let's say this is a tree, you know, a good sized tree. That means the wind's gonna catch it and try to blow it over. So what I want to do is I want to take stakes. Now I've got little miniature stakes here. In reality, I'm actually going to use this thing. And I'm going to show you this again in a minute, but this is uh, what we use for uh, staking trees. This is a lodge pole, it's eight foot tall. And I'm going to show it to you again in, in a moment after I do this. 
So, find a spot where I can either punch this through the wee cloth or in between the slits. I'm gonna take this, and in this case I'm using a hammer. Right. I don't have to aim this first one perfectly. Actually, I'm gonna do this this way because of the way that I'm facing. All right, I'm gonna take my second one. I'm gonna put it down and I'm gonna face and make sure all three line up, the tree trunk and all uh, both stakes. All right. Let's see if I can move that a little bit so you can see what's going on. Did I bring the wire up? I had wire in my hand when I came up here. Well, leave it to me to figure out how to do lose that. I've got some uh, vinyl tape. I'm going to use that for right now. That's fine. Normally, I do this with anchor wire, which apparently I left down there. I guess I must have put it down just before I came up. So I'm going to take this. I want to have it above the halfway point for sure. Preferably more like two thirds, almost to three quarters. I don't want to have it way up here. This stuff is so flimsy, it could just pull right out of the V-strap. So this is the V-strap, nylon. And I would take this, and I try to put it above a, a branch so that it can't slip down the trunk. I've seen that happen before. hold this in place so that the trunk is in the center and tie this on the V strap. Okay. Again, normally you'd be using wire. For small lightweight things you could definitely use um, uh, vinyl tape. You'd be surprised how strong it is, especially this wide stuff. All right. And I'm going to tie that on. going to tie to the other side. Tie that onto the V-strap. Okay, and then what I'm going to do in this case we don't have a whole lot of width to, to deal with, so I'm going to find that a little bit. Again, the soil is softer than normal. When you pound these in, make sure they go past the hole that you dug and anchor into that hard, undisturbed soil. And I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna pull it tight. Really go ahead and pull it. This should move. If it's moving, it means that you don't have it pounded in enough. So you should be able to go ahead and take this and pull it tight and wrap it around this and then go ahead and tie it on, all right? And that is going to hold the, the uh, the tree from moving around. I get a lot of questions about this. Uh, the, no, you don't have to worry that uh, the tree sways. It's okay for the tree to sway. This is good. Good exercise for the tree. They have muscles like us. They need to exercise. This is good. What we don't want is for the tree to bend over so far that the roots actually kind of shift in the soil. Then you'll actually have a tree that's sitting uh, tilted. Uh, something I forgot to, to mention. Uh, that is fairly north. That is fairly north over there. Most of the time the wind comes from the southwest. So I, I would put the first stake facing that way because that's where the most strength is between these two stakes. It's going to have, it's going to be able to go in all directions, but most of the year it's going to the southwest, so it's blowing this way. So you want to have the, the stakes in line with that, that wind, if possible. All right. Okay, we were gonna cover some of the tools and then uh, anything else we wanted to, that I might be forgetting, Ken? That we wanted to make sure we covered? I think that's good. Okay. Well. Mm -hmm. Would you mention to everybody the pitfalls of disadvantages 
of sharing up the tree, you know, lifting all the limbs. You know, a lot of people plant like that mm -hmm. beautiful thing, and then they'll trim half the foliage off the base and they never. So most of the time, you can go ahead and make the tree look like whatever you want. Um, there, there's some schools of thought on, on, you know, when and how you should do that. As we're, we're talking, I'm going to point this out. We want to water. When you put the, put the hose on a trickle, put it directly over the, the root ball. Usually the trees already are limbed up fairly high. What I would recommend if you're going to take off limbs, um, take off no more than a third of the canopy at a time. Wait for the tree to grow and then you can take off more. Give it a, a good watering. Whatever size uh, pot it was, say it was a 25 gallon tree, give it about 25 gallons. If it's a 10 gallon tree, give it about 10 gallons. Uh, if it's a real small one like this where it's only one gallon, double that. Uh, or the two gallon, double that. The first gallon just doesn't go very far. And then, That's a good idea. Well, I, I just uh, made a new planting watering guide. You just made a watering guide, planting health care guide for the landscape group, for the, for the planters. Wonderful. I'll, I'll make sure you get a copy of that too. It's a little yeah. bit more, more detailed. More okay. detailed. Yeah. I think you all would eat that up. The first, first week, really watch it closely. Uh, you're getting to know the soil in that spot for the first time. So make sure it's getting enough and not too much, uh, especially making sure that it gets enough. Especially those of you who have that sandy soil, it drains faster, so kind of keep checking it over the first week or two. Make sure that uh, you've got the, the watering schedule just right for that tree. You may have to hand water. Maybe your, your drip system comes on once a week, but your new plant needs it two, maybe even three times a week. So don't be afraid to just keep checking it and make sure that it's getting enough. And then the last thing you want to do is take your root and grow. This is root stimulator, anti-shock, helps it to uh, adjust more readily to its, its new environment, grow up brand new roots to replace anything that got torn up as we were planting and scoring and all that. This is, uh, so many of you are already familiar with our root and grow. It's always had fantastic feedback. We actually would have improved it. It's at now more natural than it was before. You remember it used to come out kind of a green color. When you open this out, up, you're gonna find that it's actually a, kind of a brown, almost sludgy looking look thing. Very natural looking, uh, but we've tested it on stress plants and, and gone through the various tests with it. Fantastic results. We're very happy with the new and improved formula. So I think you're really, really gonna like this. Anytime you have a, a plant that you just planted, anything that's under stress for any reason, the root and grow is going to help it get through that. So whatever, whatever caused the stress or shock, this is going to help uh, fix that. If, if you want to prevent shock from uh, transplanting, this is going to help with that. So you're, you're going to give a good watering to this, and then you're going to pour some of this into a bucket of water. It's almost a quarter cup per gallon. And then you water a few gallons into the root ball. Again, pour it directly into the roots. And that's going to help a very, very great deal with whatever the plant is going through. Okay. I suggest doing that right after you plant. I usually mix the root and grow before I even start. I just have it there. So when it's planted, I water it in, then I top it off with root and grow, and I'll follow up at least one other time about two weeks later. And I'll keep that two week sequence until I see the plant obviously taking. They go through a stress. It's like open heart surgery and brain surgery at the same time. When you take this plant out of this bucket it's known its entire life, put it in your yard, it's really rough, especially in our alkaline water. So I, I keep doing that every two weeks until it's obviously stabilized. And generally twice we'll do it. Sometimes you need a third or fourth time. Uh, you can bring things back. I mean, literally, I could probably take this uh, stake driver, put it in the ground, give it root and grow, and it will start to grow. <laughs> It's almost that good. I mean, it's not quite, but I've literally taken things home that someone returned going, you sold me a bad plant, it's all your fault. <laughs> I would come back and I could replant it because it's mine now. Give it some root and grow and it just takes off. So my, most of my yard is, I've got a nice yard, is like, is rescues. Like that. Yeah, rescues. Same, same with mine, it's yeah. mostly rescues. <laughs> but, you know, this, this stuff is also good uh, for transplant shock, but if you've got a tree that maybe turned really early, turned color, it's obviously stress or grubs got into it, you need to grow more roots. 
give it some of this in addition to your fertilizer, it'll start to root out stronger. So makes a great house plant. I've used it in my own house plants. It's like magic. Oh my gosh. In fact, I'm thinking about dropping Schultz and some of the other national brands and just doing this. But it's basically it's a compost tea that we've developed. So it's got a lot going on for it. Thank you, Ella. I appreciate that. It's always good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the more plants so the question was, if it's say a drought tolerant or native plant, mm -hmm. would you use the same process? Absolutely. Okay. Drought tolerant plants actually get their drought tolerance from having lots of soil around their roots. Without that insulation, they lose that drought tolerance. So it's very important that you get them rooted properly. So this is going to be essential. And again, remember that the natives out there growing in the wild, they are actually pitying your plants in your landscape because of what the contractor did to your yard. It's not the natural stuff that they got their start in. So yes, you definitely need to help them along. It's even more important is okay. what it comes down to. Would you yeah. recommend that also in pots? Absolutely, yes. You use the root and grow no matter what you're planting in. Raised beds, pots, containers, whatever. Use the root and grow, definitely. If you're going to plant directly in big pots, like I grow, I've got peaches in pots. I've got tree shrubs in pots, roses in pots. I have a lot of pots. There, I, I change it. I just plant directly in potting soil. So there, we actually made a local soil. It's our, it's our water's potting soil. You fill the pot up, plant directly in it. And it's basically what the plants are grown in. Just you're giving it more soil to grow in. So it's, it's, they root very easily with that. But still fertilize and root and grow afterwards. You do, you do still need the root and grow. Yeah, everything you plant, everything you ever pull out of the pot, root and grow, root and grow, root and grow, at least twice. So it's what's gonna keep it from going into transplant shock, shedding its foliage, turning yellow, having issues, so. So we go Yeah, so eventually it stabilizes and go, well, this may not be okay. I mean, this may be okay. Maybe I'll start to root. And you'll know because you'll start putting on new foliage. You'll start to bloom again. When you first put it in the ground, it sheds all its leaves. It sheds its, its flowers. So you can see it's just having struggling. Then it stabilizes, starts to force new leaf buds, and it takes off. From that point on, your fertilizer takes over. That compost you put in that takes it and runs with it. Okay? So some of the plants, should we go over that? So I brought a few things. I'll just touch on a few. Right now, be careful. I was just roaming around, looking at all the, my competition, which are basically box stores, Home Depot Lowe's, or my, we call them Depot's, I can't say that I'm in film. Can I do that? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Depot's, Depot and Devil both start with D. We have, the, we have tattoos we issue when you get hired, and, and Lucifer's Lowe's, so it's kind of like, we, they're our nemesis. We just, they want ill for us, and we want ill for them, so we check them off, and, uh, they now have the summer mix kind of still being stocked. So you'll see zinnias. It's ridiculous. Uh, you're seeing all that summer stuff. We're, we're about to have frost, like within a month. So on your elevation, Broom Creek, you'll have it sooner, sooner than that. But our, last, our first frost date is generally October 29th. We use Halloween as the frost. Well, if you're planting those things and you were sold it was pretty, it'll stay pretty until it gets down to about 45 degrees. Well, some of you are already seeing low 40s, high 30s at the ridge lines. They're just gonna struggle, turn yellow, dampen off, fall over, and you think you're a bad gardener. You were sold a bill of goods. You need to be, you need to, you need to be transitioning now from summer plants to fall and winter plants. So we don't have any of those things, even in stock. If you came and asked for it, we go, go to Home Depot or Lowe's. They've got them. We don't want to do that. Don't want to torture our customers. So, and that's that. They've got a buyer for all 50 of their stores. They just go ship 50 of those to all my stores. And mainly in Phoenix, it's great. They don't get frost. Up here we do. So be careful. Do your home. Do your due diligence before you go out and just go plant stuff. These are things I brought that are obviously part of the winter fall mix. And it starts all around town. You're starting to see um, this is Virginia creeper. It grows wild. It's a native. Uh, just grow up in the Bradshaws, Mingus Mountains. You just see this growing underneath the oaks. and the, It also grows really well in your backyard. It's a great ground cover. 
uh, fence to cover that ugly block fence. Feels like I'm in Russia, kind of like put a, put a trellis up, it just grows up there. Um, it can actually cling itself, kind of make it go, but it softens things up. It's one of the first ones that, that announces autumn is here. This and Boston Ivy, and they're just related to each other. So you're starting to see this show up. So some of the aspens have that first leading edge of color. So here in two weeks, you'll see fall everywhere. So it'll just be obviously better um, than autumn. So this is a great one you could plant. This one would be critical to plant, as Ella had mentioned. It's very sensitive to wet roots, it rots. It's very drought hardy. Now plants that are drought hardy, like that manzanita that you took out of my pot. I can't believe you did that to my poor manzanita. It doesn't matter, it doesn't care. This is a, this is a, we sell the native manzanita, but many times that's too big. It's just too large. I mean, it gets up head high, it gets a monster. So this is a, it looks just like it has a red bark, evergreen, same bell-shaped flower in spring. Uh, but this one only gets up to about hip high. So much easier to maintain and manage, looks better in the yard. Uh, extreme, I cannot grow this in my backyard, I've killed five. I'm on the north slope of an Eagle Ridge, solid clay. It's the hardest gardening I've ever done. Well, my soil, no matter how much I don't water, it still loads up and, and root rots the roots. So I think the only way to, for me to grow this one would be in a raised bed or a container or something. Then it would grow because now it can ensure the drainage. So this has to have drainage or it's just going to drown to death. Just so I don't forget to put this bag in the boot. Well, we have several different, we sell uh, probably five different types of manzanitas because it just adapts so well. If you're going to plant some of these really robust uh, natives, I would say don't put it on the drip system. Hand water uh, so that you don't overwater, so you can monitor a little bit better. Get established and then you can just let it go by itself. So I do that quite a bit. My front yard is, is very high touch, high fashion. You walk by, you kind of go, oh. I got mine on a garden center. Whoa, that's pretty nice. It's, it's nice. The backyard is all native. I've adapted to the junipers that were there, the oaks that were there, the cliff rows, and I just have cleaned them up, and then I've added two more natives. So there, I still have drip systems. I'll generally drip them for about a, about a year, and then once they're adapted, once they've rooted out from that bucket into the surrounding soil, I bend back that drip system, and I cut it off, just thinking, they might need some help in the future, I don't know. I've never reactivated a drip system on a native again, uh, but it's for me. I feel better, like I could nurture it if it needs to. I had mentioned it when we started, this is probably our most famous fall shrub, or perennial, it's really an herbal, it's a, it's a woody perennial. Uh, this is autumn joy, see, this is not autumn joy, see, this is autumn sage, mm -hmm. salvia gregii comes in a lot of different colors. You probably have three or four colors down there right now. Gets up about that tall. Kind of knee-high and kind of ball-shaped. Kind of very nice. Hummingbirds think they've died and gone to heaven. You will have, you can put the feeders away. They're, they're gonna go after this. Uh, they just love it so much. Butterflies like it. Bees, it's a pollinator plant. Songbirds. Uh, yeah, so lots of things. This, this brings the, the uh, uh, nature into your yard. I've got a whole row of these in my front front right by the street. It's very hot. I neglect it because I'm downhill a little bit, but I want you to drive by and go, oh, that looks pretty good. It's pure design. I put four of them in a row and I back them up with four or five Russian sage. It's contrasting different heights. It looks good. This one, they look ex exceptionally good now because they're always throwing flowers off. If you're fertilizing them enough, they're always putting flowers off. But in the summer, they tend to put a flower off for a day or two and then fade with the next flower. Now, because it's so cool, we're putting flowers off, then they put more flowers off, they, put, they just aren't shedding their foliage, uh, their, their flowers, and that's why they're most famous in the autumn of the year. Yeah. Would you trim that? When, when would you trim it? Or? So when should you trim this? Uh, I, they're pretty low maintenance. What I do, this has been, I've had some failures with this when I planted it in the fall and winter, and I went with a small size. And then we had a crazy harsh winter. I've lost them. So I think the secret is here's what I found really works. Plant a bigger model, and because the foliage is so uh, full, it insulates the roots, and you just have more roots. 
Uh, and then I do not prune my sages until next March. I leave all that foliage up just to ensure that it's insulated. It protects itself. And then I'll go ahead and trim them back pretty heavy. Otherwise, it gets kind of mangy and woody on the inside, and they look kind of bad. This one also is not meant to live forever. I think sometimes we keep our plants in the yard too long. So junipers are a classic. You, you can almost date a neighborhood of the junipers planted. They get woody, thin, they're too large, they've never been trimmed back. And once they get that large, you try to trip, get them back under control, they never fill back in with good uh, uh, foliage, needles. Uh, so you almost have to rip them out and start fresh. This one can do the same thing. It'd be too woody, too mangy looking. I think roses are that way. Uh, sometimes rosemary can get kind of that way. Just if it looks bad, and you tried to clean it up a year, and, and, and the next year it still looks bad, it's time for a reset. So in my mind, I always try to add about 10% fresh plants in my yard. So I've always got some freshness, some new things coming up to make the old guys look good. So anyway, that's just kind of a designer's. We didn't mean to go that far into that. That's kind of a design thing we do. This one just came in. This is a famous, famous winter. Every just looks green. Just looks it's this color year round. This is dwarf Mugo pine, M-U-G-H-O. Hugo pine. It's a short, low-growing pine tree, and this particular variety does not have the bark beetle issues, uh, scale, some of the issues that some of the other native pines do. This is just get it started, and it just gets fuller, neater, and cleaner, and just always looks like this. It's a great winter plant. It look great in containers, out right out in the yard. Um, this is another one. I can't believe this thing is blooming again. <laughs> Um, this is Raphaeolyptus, or Indian Hawthorn. It's an evergreen, very low growing. I guess there's different models, but this particular one stays low. Uh, but it blooms in the spring with the most fragrant of flowers. It's just when, uh, when the lilacs are blooming, that's about when this will be blooming. We've been so mild and it's, they're so happy here that it's decided, what the heck, I'll bloom a second time. It's kind of what's going on. So and they can do that sometimes, okay? Indian, Indian hawthorn, or my other cart, yeah. that had more flowery perennial stuff mm. here. So right now, I am actively, I've got 54 pots, big ones, in my yard. So 20 or 30 in the front, 20 or 30 in the back. I love, I've had two back surgeries. My yard is impossible to plant in. So I basically have turned everything into raised beds or containers. That, and we have this beautiful backyard that's got a negative edge patio, and I did not want to have a railing up there to keep the grandkids from falling over. It's like six foot down, overlooking the ponds, and it's beautiful. And so I took pots. I said, okay, I'll keep them in with that, and some furniture and some things. And it's there, what, what I'm doing right now, we are actively looking for things that look stressed. Uh, they're not happy with the shorter daylights, the cool nights, so a lot of plants are fading right now. Uh, so I'm going, okay, that's it. I'm not waiting for you to bring me down. I'm ripping those things out now and I'm replacing them with the, the autumn, winter blooming things. They're so mild, you can have color year round. So my tomatoes, some tomatoes have just faded. I'm going, I know you don't have time to produce any more fruit. You're out. I know you look good, but I know what you're going to prefer. You're not going to perform. So I'm ripping those out and I'm replacing them things with things like lettuce. They love, in fact, the flavor comes out more when you've got cool nights, frost, snow, this thing will actually you'll be harvesting fresh salads for Thanksgiving, Christmas, by planting now, because we're so mild. This is difficult for you folks from the Midwest who go, what? We have eight foot frost lines. Everything's dead for like, it's just a winter gray for the next six months. No, not here. It's not why we moved here. We moved here because it's very mild for our seasons. Um, I brought this up. We have basil. If you even think cold thoughts to basil, it will die. So it doesn't like to be, it likes summer. It likes like Hawaii summer. It likes like with sunlight. We have these mainly indoor gardens. A lot of the chefs will come in and go, I like fresh organic wood. They'll pick them. It's made for indoor stuff. This will not go even into mid-October. It's not gonna make it. But look for that. Do your homework. Like I said, you're seeing a lot of different transitions. Summer plants. We don't have many, but basil's so popular that you just can't go out of it 
but, but in a couple of weeks we'll bring this indoors and use it as a house plant, sell them as window boxes or whatever. Okay, so a couple of my favorites. This is one I love, and it's kind of an unusual one. Anyone know what this is? Cal calendula, very, very good. So this plant I planted last fall, and it's, it's like this big now. It's planted this size, it's like this big, and it has not stopped blooming for even a day. A calendula is just a magical plant for up here. Um, what happens is when it gets done fading, you just you take that head, you deadhead it. There's a little bit of maintenance when you got to take the old spent flower up. Doesn't do it automatically. Then it will automatically send another flower up right afterwards. So year round, yep, year round. It's amazing. Now to give it a fair shot, it likes more cool weather. So I do have mine planted. The base in a pot underneath my peach tree. In a container, it's right there. So it gets sun. I think it gets midday, afternoon stuff. But I, I must have it in the right spot. But this is a this is a magical plant that you don't normally see or may not be familiar with as much as now that you're in the mountains. This is a great mountain plant. How about I'll, I'll plant that with things like kale. This is ornamental kale. Um, this is just meant to look pretty. And the colder we get, the more beautiful, the more color comes out. And so if you plant this too early, it bolts and sends off this very fragrant flower. It's very pretty. Uh, this is one that needs to be planted in the fall and it goes right through winter. And finally next June, it'll start to bolt. This is one we put out in front of hotels and stuff, pots. Because it looks so good for so long. And then when it does come up into flower, it has this wonderful fragrance that comes out. So people go, what is, what is that? It's a kale, you wouldn't expect that. Uh, be careful with this one. Javelina just think they've died and gone to heaven. They'll look, they'll scour it, look for it. So you kind of want this one protected from the backyard. Vermin, yeah. yeah. So this one is flowering stock. Stock, here, just take that and smell it, pass it around. Kind of reminds me of snapdragons, but again, it likes the autumn. It just has a crazy long bloom cycle, but nothing has fragrance like that. This one I love to have by my front door. Uh, the decks, the pat, where you're sitting, entertaining people coming and going. I love to have those in pots because it brings it up closer to your, so the fragrance is more right there for you to enjoy. It raises it up, so it's right there. I do notice that Havilena don't bother my stock. Deer don't eat it. It's got that rough, uh, rough edge. They don't eat this one. This is what every yard should have at least one snapdragon. It comes in every color. It's almost a wildflower. It reseeds and comes up in other places. A little secret I brought for you just for this, the reason I brought it for, for you all, um, it'll send off these, these waves of, of flowers, and it'll get about this tall. When it finally gets done, bloom, gets done blooming about December, I'll cut back those dead, um, the spent flowers back to the green. It's actually evergreen. Let's keep the green foliage. So my container, I still got green looking there. Which is for a gardener, that's enough sometimes. When it's snowing outside, you just kind of, you just want it, you're tired of being indoors. Just looking outside, looking at green is good. I'll fertilize this with the, uh, it's just what I do. This, my name's Ken. We're just friends. We're talking over the back fence. This works for me in my backyard. I think it'll work for you. Uh, what I do is, starting about Valentine's, something like that, I clean it up. I've looked at green all year. You'll notice the, the cold is definitely over. January's done. Things are stirred. There's kind of, you can feel like spring might be right around the corner. I'll fertilize it with the flower power, this stuff. This is water soluble. Someone mentioned it. Are those water soluble? They aren't. This is one we've made that's water soluble. This is like magic for things that bloom containers, flowers, vegetables, tomatoes the size of your head. Um, this is called flower power. I'll got a scoop, a scoop per gallon. I'll mix up my water can, give it to my snapdragons, and they instantly start taking off and bolt into a whole other set of flowers, just, just like that. In the spring. In the spring, yeah. Well, late winter mainly, because these yeah, I, I, get the most out of it. You can cheat, you can force them to bloom earlier than everyone else. Your neighbor's gonna go, how'd you do that? I was at a class with Ken, oh, they taught me flower power. <laughs> it really works. Improved in uh, formula. Yeah, we did, we put more minerals and stuff. Uh, what, what, what happened was, how this came about, first of all, I like plants. I like to figure out what makes what tickles their feet so they want to root and grow. Um, we're having a problem. We sell hundreds, probably thousands of hanging baskets, mainly for Mother's Day. 
people come in. And here's two hanging baskets for you, Mom. They love you. About four weeks later, they would stop blooming. Just had this beautiful green basket. They bought it from us, full colored. You can't even see the foliage. It was always the same thing, every time. Yeah, I watered it with miracle Grow once, and then it hasn't bloomed since. miracle Grow is not your friend, I'm just telling you. I know it's the number one sold ag product for the backyard ever that has ever existed, but don't buy it. Don't buy it again, because um, it interacts with our the salt, the salt-based fertilizer that interacts with our water, our alkaline water, that white buildup in your, in your sink, in your toilets, that builds up in the soil. It prevents the plants from blooming. And so every time it's the same thing. So we stopped selling miracle Grow, which is a bold move. I mean, that's one you put on an end cap, stack it high, watch it fly, make money. It's hard to pull the plug on a number one seller. We said, okay, that's not right for us. Our customers do better with, this is what we made to counteract that. And this is a little bit more expensive. Actually, it's not. Per gallon mixed up, it's the same. But this will actually work with our water and make things bloom. So it's a little bit different. I wouldn't use this for plantings for what Ella was doing. There you need some more meat and potato stuff, but if you've got things you want to bring into bloom, oh, this works. And then lastly, I'll, well, a couple others. This is one of my just personal favorites. Anytime you see dianthus or carnation or pinks, they're all the same plant. They're cousins, same genus. This happens to be Jolt Cherry Dianthus. I've got several of these. They come in different kind of bright fluorescent colors, but they bloom an amazing long time, and the animals don't eat them, don't bother them. They look delicious, but they don't bother them. Smell delicious too. Full sun, they smell good. Um, it's evergreen, mine. It went right through winter last year. Not in full bloom, but in full bud, but it looks green, it just looks fabulous. Out in a raised bed container, just in the yard, it's a perennial, come back every year. So dianthus pinks, there's several varieties down there. This is one, just a little, little way that I use this. Sedums, you can hear the word sedums, so autumn joy sedum, it's a tall one that's turning red right now. Uh, you've got these uh, just different, there's a whole table, nothing but sedums. They're kind of like cactus without thorns, so you can just hug this. I took one of the, I took this one, this variety, we pre-mixed it so it's got some contrast, kind of designer, we put our designer flair to it, put them together. I just put this into a round bowl. I've got a table out in the front yard that is just out there. You know, your tables kind of, they need something. They look kind of bare. It's, I don't know, the furniture covers just don't quite do it. The pads are not bright enough. It needs something pretty. This is a big, long table from me to you. It's so long. It needs something living. And so this is so tough that you can't kill it. It's a cactus. So I put this right in the middle of that bowl. It's about this big. Now it's just overflowing. It's glorious. And it will be evergreen right through winter. It'll put on these long tendrils. You see it starting to want to tendril down. I put this in a big square pot before. The tendrils will actually go down, I don't know, three, four, five feet. They'll just keep, keep flowing. Then they'll reach the earth and kind of start growing that way. They just kind of spread around. We use them in rock gardens most often, but it, they look really good in just containers that are hard to maintain. So that's one that we're most famous for herbs. I brought this just because it's blooming again. Rosemary blooms several times. Now this is a creeping rosemary. It grows over like rock walls, in between boulders, that kind of stuff. Uh, be careful, the lesson I brought this with, for this is be careful which rosemary you plant. The varieties that grow down in the deserts they won't winter over for us. Or they're more wimpy. You get a harsh winter, they just die off, which I don't mind. I own a garden center, I can sell you another one. But with your friend, you kind of want her to be successful. And so this one's called Huntington Carpets, with the most robust ground cover type of, of rosemary. So you can use it for cooking, it smells really good. But mine will bloom in March. It blooms like three or four times. And it's not unusual to see them bloom. In, in the autumn as well. Okay. Lastly, don't forget your grass country. We're famous for especially the valley areas, uh, Prescott Valley, Kirkland, Paulden, Skull Valley. We just we're famous for our prairies, and so grasses do really, really well here. And this is called um, little bunny grass. It's, this is tall as it gets. It has this great big seed head that holds that head for 
really right through winter. It'll turn straw color, but it'll hold that shape and those, those seed heads um, right through winter. Eventually snows will come, kind of beat it up, it'll lay over, and then I just cut it back. Fertilize it again, it'll take off. Again, it's a perennial grass. Um, I don't know that I would suggest planting a pampas grass in your yard. Most yards are too small for those. That's that huge, it's a monster. I mean, children, small dogs have been lost. Front? What's that? Is that what you have That's what's out front. front. Yeah. I put them out there because it's number one seller. I'm going to tease Beautiful. people to buy more because I, I got my kid from grad school. I got to pay another tuition payment. Uh, but I don't have one in my own yard. It's too aggressive. I'd rather go with a bisacanthus yeah. or a zebra grass. I have a lot of grasses, but I go with the smaller ones that are just easier to maintain. Uh, that's just me, though. If you, if you love pampas grass and you're a florist, you're going to cut those off and bring them in and spray paint them with hairspray to keep lock them into place and use them as ornamental. That's a common thing. Go for it. I have them. They're on sale. Buy one. They're, 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 they're gorgeous. They're in bloom. But I would rather see purple, uh, uh, a little bunny grass because it's so easy to maintain. With that, what my thought was, and we're like an hour 15 in, so if you got to go or your bum hurts, take your, you are released. But if you want, I thought I'd just walk, just maybe one loop, show you a couple highlights that might be of interest to you, and then, then if you've got questions, we can just interact off the, off the microphone. Last question, I guess. One, one question. What do you play here that's very shade tolerant, that's a good structural background, Yeah, shade lovers are going to be more like the hollies. Um, I would say that's a shade lover that grows naturally. Native stuff's going to be uh, um, Oregon grape or Mahonia. That's a classic number one seller for that. Uh, hollies will actually adapt really well. In my backyard, it's all natives. But I had this two and a half story stucco wall, no windows, nothing. It's the back side of the garage, it was ugly. Oh my gosh. How do I turn this lemon into lemonades? What I did is I put a beautiful piece of art in front of the wall, mm -hmm. and it took two Hicks U's. They're not native. Yeah. But they're on the north side, mm -hmm. and Hicks U grows up almost unlimited. They're now up about 15, 16 feet tall, and they're about this big around. Just call them, and I framed this piece of art on either side, and then I uplift the, the art. So actually, this is like a white spot now in my yard. So it's in more shaded areas, it opens it up a little bit because it's, they don't get roasted by the sun. So you can, you can adapt some, but number one would be uh, Oregon grape. I'm sure there's others. So those three from the homies will do fine in the shade here? Oh yeah, really, really well. You'll find them growing in the forest. That's where they grow wild. Trees, yeah. yeah, that's where you see them growing well, wild. They have a here. very wide range in yeah. nature. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. And there's three sizes. There's yes. this size. Okay. There's this size. And there's creeping. The creeping one is the native one for here. Really Another question? When's the ideal time to plant trees? So when's the best time to plant trees? Now, fall is actually the ideal time. Uh, here's the secret with that, with this caveat. Okay. This is the best time to plant because they'll continue to root through the end of the year so you have more root mass before next, the heat of next summer. And then you'll get another burst of growth in March and April as they wake up, they go root even more. Uh, it's all about June. June is the hardest month to grow things here. It's hot, dry, windy, it's just tough. So the more months you can plant before the month of June, the better off you are. So autumn is why it's so good. With that, here's the caveat. If you live in an HOA, the HOAs are already coming through and powering down all the drip systems. So they're already going to blow them out, clean them up. We don't know. Um, you will have to water that plant through winter because it can't. We're so mild. We don't frost. We don't uh, freeze. We don't have a frost line. So plants are still actively growing. They're still putting buds. They're still rooting even in January. You have to water that plant by hand if you don't have your drip system on at least two times a month. Just twice, pick a hand, just water it in. That'll keep it healthy so you keep those new roots healthy and then and then grow. So as long as you're watering now is the best time. No, what they do is if well, it depends on which HOA. Some of them are, are common front yards basically. Or your landscaper, if you got a gardener coming, they'll go, I'm gonna shut your system down because I'm in the neighborhood. 
from the next neighborhood next. And so they'll, they'll power down. Uh, typically by November 1, they'll have all the systems drained, turned off. And so a plant cannot go from November through next April without water. Can't do it. It needs water. So it's unique to the mountains of Arizona. So kind of know that, that you'll need to hand water, turn on by hand or manually every once in a while. Otherwise you will have winter kill, you'll have, you'll have damage. So some, you'll see the tops of, of shrubs kind of died off. We're covering that neck more next, next class. Next week is gardening for newcomers. We go deep into that, cross dates, zones, all that stuff, lots of handouts. This is more down and dirty, part of the fun. Uh, yes, last question. Does the Vinca Major grow up here in the shade? Yeah. Vinca Major grows better in the sunnier areas. Vinca Minor grows better in the shaded areas. So we've got both. Uh, Minor's more, uh, more, more of a shade. shade yeah. 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 Great, great question, though. This is a great perennial country. We're famous for our perennials up here. So, okay. With that, let's give it up for Ella one more time. And I'm gonna pull my microphone and then we'll just, if you want to, I'll just kind of start here and make a big loop and then